My name is Nassim Hermain. I'm a researcher in unified physics. I'm the director of research at the Resonance Science Foundation, and I'm the executive director of R&D at Taurus Tech. The holographic mass paper was really an extension of an earlier paper in which I was making calculations about the nuclei of atoms, the proton, um, and its capacity to create nuclei uh, throughout the table of elements, that is the capacity of confining protons together, that is, you know, protons are positively charged. and just like when you bring two magnets together of the same polarity, they want to repel, and they want to repel very strongly. Protons are highly charged, and they're squished together in a very small radius of the nuclei of an atom. And so these forces are extreme uh, that keep it there against the repulsion they should experience from their charge. That force is not well described in quantum theory. And um, I was coming from more of a cosmology uh, approach and the physics that I was applying kind of worked um, in this earlier paper. That is, I started to describe the little proton as a black hole, as a mini black hole, a teeny weeny black hole. Um, because it has a lot of those qualities. And when I calculated, I calculated the strength that a little mini black hole the size of a proton would have in terms of its gravitational attraction to another proton, and it matched, not approximately, it matched exactly that force that seems to be holding the protons together in the nuclei of the atom. So I thought this is very interesting and it cannot be a coincidence. And it led eventually to the holographic mass paper um, because I had to explain how the little proton could be a black hole, although it doesn't have the mass that you would expect from a black hole. It is um, a different kind of black hole than the black holes that are typically described. In astrophysics, the black holes uh, are thought to be these monsters that are absorbing everything around them. My physics and how I looked at these objects, even in terms of astrophysics, uh, I started to think about them in a little bit different ways because I added spin and Coriolis effects in the structure of space-time to make these black holes spin. And I calculated how fast they would be spinning and I started to realize that actually very little material could fall in the black hole because they would get flung out, if you'd like, um, from uh, Coriolis forces and from uh, centrifugal forces. And so that very little material could fall in. And I start to describe these things uh, early on, and actually this has been confirmed now. We, we're starting to see from astrophysical black hole in the universe, the center of galaxies, um, that they spin very, very fast. Uh, some of the latest measurements show it, show black holes uh, at the center of galaxies, which are huge, spinning at some 85% the speed of light. It's, it's remarkable. And that very little matter can fall in at those speeds. And so, I was uh, looking at the nuclei of atoms and I was finding that there was a lot of uh, relationship the way the nuclei behaves and I thought that I should uh, apply this but when I did I had to describe it a little differently and this is why you know a movie was published called Black Holes, W-H-O-L-E because you know it's no longer a hole in space it's actually it's a different animal it, it, because when I applied it at the quantum level and I calculated a little bit differently than astrophysical black holes, I, I found a new solution to Einstein field equation. That is, Einstein's equation predicted black holes. Uh, Einstein himself didn't think they, they existed. He, he thought that was that part of his um, general relativistic equation was wrong. Like the, that was just a mathematical problem, not 
actual physical thing that you could find a singularity in the universe. And of course, at this time, it was inconceivable those things would exist. So in general, that part of his equation were ignored. Um, John Wheeler later on coined the term black hole and, and started to write the math of what that singularity would look like. And eventually, black holes were found mostly in the center of all galaxies, which my equations predicted, but as well, it was found that black holes have a quantum interaction. That is, that the surface, this is called the event horizon, this is the, the boundary in which light is no longer able to escape, it's sucked into the, to the singularity. That boundary is actually made up of little Planck pixels little pieces of information of all the stuff that fell into the black hole. And, and this mathematical solution to black holes was actually, you know, thought to be a um, holographic solution. And that's when the holographic approach was first born. And, and you might have seen on magazines, you know, do we live in a, in a holographic universe? It became more and more popular. So I, I applied that solution, but a little bit differently to the nuclei of an atom that we call a proton. And when I did, something remarkable happened. I didn't do it the way the standard model was doing the holographic solution, um, but I made the little pixels, little spheres. And I calculated how many of these pixels were on the surface of a proton and how many were on the inside. And when I did that, something remarkable happened because the energy or the mass of all the little Planck spheres that would be inside a proton was the exact mass of all the other protons in the universe. That is, the mass of the universe was inside one proton. That made it significantly holographic. That made it really holographic, not just as an analogical terminology, but actually really holographic, in which every proton had the information of all the other protons. And certainly, if the mass of the universe in terms of information is inside one proton, it made it a black hole. Of course, when I published this, it was very difficult for people to accept. I had to be able to explain how is it that the proton has such an incredible mass. So I started to think about it and it's like, well, if the mass is inside the black hole, you can't measure it. What are you measuring? You're measuring the relationship of that mass with its surface. So then I counted how many of these little bits of information are on the surface, right? The, the holographic surface and I made a relationship between the information that's inside and the information that's outside on the surface. And so how much information is actually able to reach us in terms of their relationship? And it outputted exactly the mass of the proton, but I mean exactly. So now you imagine you have an equation that involves the mass of the universe, which is huge. And by the time you're done with a simple ratio relationship, you output the exact mass of the object you're observing or that you're measuring. So it's, and, and from those equations, then I was able to predict what exactly the radius should be. And that's when I made that prediction that eventually was measured in the laboratory in an accelerator in Switzerland and confirmed. So it's very exciting. And it says something very fundamentally different about atoms. The Schwarzschild solution is the solution that was given. It was the first exact solution that was given to Einstein field equations. Einstein described gravity by saying space-time is curving in the vicinity of mass or energy. Um, so he took gravity out of the object, basically, as was described before him by Newton, saying that the object was producing this force. Um, and he said, actually, it's the mass of the object curving space-time, curving the structure around it. Like if you put a ball on a trampoline, the surface tend to curve. And then if you put another ball, it, it looks like it's attracted because the surface is curved, right? So 
this is described as the curvature of space-time by Einstein. He give the concept, and it sounds simple, but it's hard to describe in mathematics. So he had to go through all sorts of genera- generation to actually describe the elasticity of the, of the membrane and how it curves and all this stuff. So it was very complex. When he wrote it, they didn't solve it. They didn't, you know, him and his collaborators were not able to solve it. And so they published it as a concept. And um, this physicist that was sick, bedridden at home, uh, coming back from the Russian front where he, where he was fighting, actually found Einstein papers within weeks of Einstein publishing it and thought, oh, I can solve that. And while, you know, very ill, actually solved, the Carl Schwarzschild solved Einstein field equation for the first exact solution. And guess what it predicted? It predicted singularity it predicted that they would be places in space where the mass would be so high that not even light could escape and he sent it back and einstein was pretty excited that it had been solved already he thought maybe it would take years and years before somebody would solve these equations and uh, but he was very disappointed that it predicted singularity because it was like does that mean this concept is wrong? Does that mean these equations are wrong? And so on. So it produced some doubt as well, but it, he succeeded in getting the solution published. And that became the Schwarzschild solution to Einstein field equation that is used widely in astrophysics every day today uh, to solve for gravitational field and how things orbit around other things and, and all this stuff. But it's commonly ignored when we use them in those equations, like if we're trying to figure out the Earth spinning around the sun, that in fact, if you look at the formulas and if you look at the equations very cleanly, very appropriately, the equations are actually making the sun a black hole and making the Earth a black hole, and then looking at the relationship between these two black holes. It kind of struck me right away that this is not so understood actually why is this happening and how is it um, what is it telling us about the universe so the, so I used the Schwarzschild equation to eventually describe the proton I called it the Schwarzschild proton um, I basically said you know you could have called it the black hole proton but I was trying to at least not be so abrasive to the mainstream to the layman or even to many physicists out there, what I'm saying right now may sound like heresy or, or you know, craziness. But I assure you that more and more physicists are now coming to the same conclusions. Mm-hmm.